My name is Joe Brockmeyer. I work for Red Hat, if uh, that wasn't clear from the slides here. I'm senior principal container evangelist or strategist or whatever. Basically, I work on telling our story about uh, containers. Um, if you want to reach me on Twitter or if you want to reach me by email, that's my contact info, just JZB on Twitter or JZB at Red Hat. Love it when people give me a shout out on Twitter if they like the talk. Uh, if you don't like the talk, it's dev at null. Uh, no. All right. So today what I want to talk about, if uh, my clicker works, that's always fun. Come on now. Here we go. So real fast, what I want to talk about today um, first, I want to talk a little bit about uh, reminding people actually about our drawing at the booth at 4.15. Uh, we are, if you're wearing a Red Hat hat and you've got the tickets, you could win a GoPro, you could win a Bose speaker. Um, so show up at the Red Hat booth, 4.15. I want to talk a little bit about what the ingredients are in the container. We've got kind of a diet menu theme with the talk here. Um, and then I want to talk about prep and why container adoption is more than just containers. Here we go. So my girlfriend really likes to make this kale salad, and you know, and it's like, you know, this would be great if it didn't have kale in it. Um, but you know, it's, she's like, oh, it's a superfood, and I kind of feel like that's how people are about containers. I've been in this business for a long time. Uh, that's how people used to be about open source. Um, you know, they just want open source. They weren't really sure about anything else, but open source was magical pixie dust that was going to make everything great. And now containers, you know, for a while it was cloud, 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 cloud was gonna make everything great, now it's containers. And I'm not saying containers aren't great, but what I'm saying is they're part of a balanced diet in IT. So, um, you know, really your diet should look something like this, don't do my diet. This is what my diet generally looks like. Um, and uh, this is actually the heart-stopping BLT from Crown Candy Kitchen in St. Louis. I'm a proud uh, St. Louis, and even though I don't live there right now, if you're ever in St. Louis, you should have one of these. But it's like Daffy Duck, the cartoon where he like drinks the gasoline and lights the match. You can do it once, once a year. Don't do it twice. Um, so let's talk very briefly about what's in a container. Now, I'm at DockerCon, right? So I'm assuming that everybody here could, if I, you know, put you on the game show format and said, okay, describe a container, you all could do that, right? You could tell me what's in a container, what is a container. Um, but it, when you talk to people, it depends, you know, who you ask what a container is. If you talk to ops people, they have one view of containers. If you talk to developers, they have a completely different view of containers, you know? Sysadmins are looking at the sandboxing and the isolation. They're looking at the container density on machines. They're looking at the portability. When you talk to developers, they're looking at, hey, I can put all my dependencies in here and I can ship a container. I literally talked to one customer who was excited about containers because if I put everything in a container, I no longer have to write the documentation for ops to deploy it. I just give them the container. Um, so it depends on who you ask. But you know, we know that containers are an evolution in packaging and deploying applications. We know that uh, this gives us a lot more efficiency. It gives us portability across environments. It gives us you know, much more consistency between environments. We know that's all great. Um, and we have you know, a lot more than just containers, though, that are critical features for dev developers and operators. They need to be able to work with multiple languages, you need to be a seamless deployment and development experience. You need to be able to collaborate between teams. You know, one of the great things about containers that we all love is that ops can take a base image and give a blessed base image to developers and they can work on that. Or you can have several layers. Uh, back when uh, we did Flock a couple of years ago, one of the guys from Yahoo was talking about, you know, we've got one team, they put an OS in the container. We've got another team, they harden and layer Apache and they put it in the container and then they give it to another team. So they, you know, they all love that. Um, I'm from Red Hat, so we believe that open source is sort of a critical feature for this. Um, obviously, for us, it has to be enterprise grade. It has to be re ready to run mission critical. Uh, has to be secure, has to be able to scale out. All these good things. I wanna talk a little bit about our container adoption program. And I don't mean you're gonna go out and adopt a small container that you know doesn't have parents. I mean, this is how you get into containers. Okay, um, what we believe is you really wanna just start. A lot of people spend a lot of time whiteboarding things and talking about things and the five-year roadmaps and all this stuff. We really believe 
you want to just start. You want to get started and avoid the long-term roadmaps. You want to break things into smaller chunks to work on them, and you want to get into a rapid feedback cycle instead of trying to do everything in one go. You want to be able to have automation, CI, CD, and you need to do pairing and mentoring. And I'm rushing through all this, by the way, I have 20 minutes, so there's much more online. Uh, how many folks are actually going to Red Hat Summit, too? I actually have to, okay, just one or two people. If you happen to be in the Boston area, I know we still have some tickets, but um, Red Hat Summit's coming up in two weeks, um, and we'll talk about all this stuff at more length. Um, and also, you know, a small failure in your container deployment is not the end of the world, it's a learning opportunity. Um, and this is, I'm gonna breeze through this real fast, I'm not gonna do this entire slide, but basically, you know, when we work with people and talk about adopting containers, we sit down and we do an overview. And this isn't like a, you know, a short-term thing. We're looking at 18 months out. We're looking at, you know, how do we get to your first success? How do we prepare everything? And how do we get going? Um, and again, I'm not gonna go through all these things, but you can see, and these slides will be available later so you can look at them in more detail. But basically, you know, when we're doing the pilots, we're doing, you know, multiple weeks and we've got them broke out into small uh, discrete chunks so that it's absorbable by your teams, okay? And let's see here, how am I doing on time? Uh, okay, yeah, I'm gonna move right along. I uh, wanna talk very briefly about considerations and onboarding applications into containers. So these are the ideals for a cloud native application. How many of you have applications today that fit all of these ideals? Wow, I, I, I covered my eyes and I'm still not seeing a lot of hands. Okay, so I think we can all agree that these are ideals, they're great ideals to have, but a lot of our applications today don't live up to these ideals. So really we wanna look at how do we go to cloud native? We first have to start with cloud compatible. We've gotta start by you know, creating support for external configurations. You've gotta remove you know, hard bindings for IP addresses. We've got to, um, this obviously is a little specific to Red Hat, but for other folks, um, you know, we need to have uh, RHEL 6.4 compatible, uh, compatible libraries to use base images. Your environment may differ a little bit, but the important thing is that basically, you know, your uh, base images, the Docker base images that you're using are portable across environments. And you wanna make sure that your logs are writing to console or standard out instead of, you know, just a file. Um, how many people have done an MVP application before? Not as many people as I expected. Quick question, how many folks in the room are ops folks? Okay, okay, how many are developers? How many people are neither a developer nor an operator? How many people are not sure they're in a room? Okay, um, so basically we have this whole stack of what applies to an infrastructure project, right? And usually people approach an MVP like this. They look at design and platform deployment and they ignore the rest of it. We think it's really important that your MVP goes across all of these layers and that you're planning your product, you know, you're designing, you're doing your platform development, you're also thinking at your project life cycle from day one. Um, you know, I know too many people who think about a project life cycle, well they don't. They don't think about like how long is this application gonna live, how are we gonna take about, how are we gonna deal with day two, right, once it's deployed. Um, you have to think about hardening not before, you know, not after it's out in the wild and like, oh look, that's how we got hacked, now we fix it. You wanna actually be thinking about that before. Um, you wanna think about your operators from day one, but again, you wanna start with the minimal, minimum viable product addressing all these things. I wanna talk real briefly now about release management considerations. So again, um, containers are part of all these things, but they're not the whole thing, right? The technology that Docker offers, the ability to run containers, that doesn't solve all of the considerations that we have. So um, we have, for example, what we call source to image with OpenShift, which gives us the ability to take code and put it into this system, do builds and deploys directly through here. Um, if you work with our consulting folks, they'll work with you and give you a example or a you know, standard container deployment pipeline. Um, but again, you, know, this is, you need to be thinking through all of these steps when you're thinking about your, employ, uh, sorry, your container deployment, not just how do I stuff it into a container. 
Um, and so at the middle of all this, this is a slide we saw earlier, but one way to do all this is to base your work on OpenShift. Um, you have some infrastructure considerations if you're gonna do that sort of thing. Um, first is you want to have a base platform that you can trust that you know is standard across your environment. Um, not just the host, but also what's in the container. And you wanna make sure that this is all working together. The next thing that you need is container and orchestration management. This can be a lot of different things. In our case, it's Kubernetes. We also use cloud forms for management. How many folks are familiar with cloud forms? I'm assuming everybody's heard of Kubernetes, right? Okay, anybody heard of cloud forms? We need to work on that, all right. Um, Manage IQ is the open source version, if anybody's used that. Um, but there are a lot of considerations at this level that you need to worry about logging and metrics. You need to worry about networking, storage. You need to have a registry for your containers. How many folks have deployed an internal registry? Okay, a few more. Um, how many people are using Docker? Okay, who's using, uh, what is it, Quay? Who's using Quay? Nobody? JFrog? Couple of folks? Anybody from JFrog here? No? Okay. Um, but you also need to have basically the ability to do build automation, build deployment. You need a service catalog. You need to be able to deploy all these things. You know, ops shouldn't have to deploy everything. Developers should be able to have a certain amount of resources and deploy automatically. Um, and then you need your services in the containers. And so this is kind of what a complete menu would look like. And, you know, remember, if you just have containers, what you've got is kale salad, you know, but what you want is the full menu. You might want kale with that. You don't want just the heart-stopping BLT. What you want is a full menu of options. Uh, if you want more information, you can find it at this URL. I'll leave that up for a minute because it's not a very memorable one. Um, but it's short. It has the, you know, advantage of being short. And again, I'll uh, make these slides available on Twitter later. I'm JZB on Twitter. If you have any questions, you can find me out in the hallway. I'm not gonna take questions up here because uh, I know we've got another speaker that needs to come up. Is Darren here? He's waving? Someone's waving, I guess it's Darren, okay. <laughs> all right, how you doing, Darren? You all ready? You excited? Okay, I, I can hear it in your voice, all right. All right, that's it for my presentation. Thank you very much. All right, um, this is uh, using containers in production shouldn't be this hard. And uh, I'm Darren Shepard from Rancher Labs. Um, <clears throat> so I only have 20 minutes, so this might be a little quick. I really don't have much time to demo. It's probably like one of the first talks I've given in a while to, that I haven't done a demo. Um, so it's actually a little different for me. Um, so just a little bit about me. I'm Chief Architect and Co-Founder at Rancher. Um, if you run into me online, I'm at I build the cloud on GitHub and Twitter. Um, basically, I've been using Docker, pretty active in the Docker community since it started. I uh, started using containers actually before that. Um, and I've been, before I was in the kind of in the container world and doing Rancher Labs, uh, I was very uh, involved in the IaaS space, OpenStack, CloudStack. So, Cloud Stack. so basically, I have a background in running these infrastructure you know, oriented things. Um, just a tiny bit about Rancher Labs. If you haven't heard about us, basically, we do a container management platform. Um, kind of whatever way you want to deploy and run your containers, we most likely support just kind of native Docker containers. If you want to use Swarm, uh, Mesos, Kubernetes, we support it all. Uh, and you know, we do our best to keep everything as simple as possible. And that's really what uh, Rancher Labs, what we're known for is just the simplicity. Um, you know, we, we do a, you know, pretty, pretty good job from what I hear from our users of trying to keep it as simple as possible. And that's really a lot about what this talk is. And I've actually been really excited to give this, this talk because, um, I don't know, it might, might have some opinions people don't opinion, agree with. So, <clears throat> basically, the container ecosystem. Um, it's confusing. It's really confusing. Um, I mean, like, really, really confusing. Like, if you look at this slide, this is the, the cloud native landscape. This is from CNCF. They kind of put this together. All those tiny little boxes. So, like, you can imagine anyone who's coming into the container ecosystem at the moment or, you know, the, uh, you know, trying to deploy containers. And these are all the options of various software and they all do different, different, you know, different things all related to containers. And so people coming in to the container ecosystem right now, honestly, are extremely confused on what they should be doing. Like, if you've been, 
using con containers for a while, like Docker was released four years ago, um, and you've been one of those early adopters, for the most part, you're probably doing fine. You've kind of, you know, as things have come, you've learned them, gotten used to everything. But for someone coming in right now, it's just, there's just an abundance of things. And, and so the question is really, you know, how do you navigate that? What you, should you be doing? There's all this talk of cloud native and, you know, the CI CD pipelines and orchestration system, all these things. Like what, you know, what should you really be doing? Um, and just kind of the summary of basically, this is kind of like, this is the summary, basically the point that I'm gonna be making in this, in this talk is when you're looking at containers, you're looking at moving to containers, really focus on what's gonna give you the most bang for your buck. The reality is the primary benefit you're gonna get from containers um, is it's just a packaging format. And I know like as engineers, we get excited about the possibilities of all the things that we could possibly do with containers and all these neat things. But just from experience, the last four years helping customers, running things ourselves, the biggest benefit you're actually gonna get is just packaging your applications in your containers. It has the side effect of increasing agility. You're gonna end up cutting your infrastructure costs. This is where you're gonna get the biggest bang for your buck. Now there's cloud native patterns, abstractions, frameworks, all those things. Those things are, you know, they take a lot more time to implement, re-architecting your application, looking at things in do, new ways, using new tools, using new patterns, all these things. The result of that, it varies. It really highly varies. Like, I've been, I've spent my entire career in architecture. I've kind of gone through a lot of different architectural trends of like service-oriented architecture and web-oriented, event-driven, message-oriented middleware, REST, uh, containers, microservices. Basically all these things, they have good things and they have bad things. They're all an incremental improvement. None of them are like just the magical, you know, it's gonna solve all the problems in the world. So if you get one thing out of this is like basically that's where you're gonna get your biggest benefit is actually just containerizing your applications. Um, so if we kind of look back at the, look back at kind of the history of, uh, you know, containers and Dockers and, and whatnot. So Docker was released uh, back in 2013, so about four years ago. And, and I looked back and I wanted to see, you know, what, what was the adoption. And if anyone knows me personally, I'm a very thorough, data-driven, analytical person. So I put together this graph to kind of show the adoption. And it looks something like that. <laughs> it, it was, uh, yeah, it took off. I mean, I've never seen an, an open source project take off like as quickly as this, just get picked up. And the thing that, you know, the reason why, you know, I co-founded Rancher Labs is because, I mean, I was myself legitimately impressed with Docker, what you could do. Just saw that like spark of when you first use it, it's just, it's cool. You immediately start thinking of like different things you can do. It just like sparks your creativity. And so what you saw with Docker was immediately, people started using it in dev and test. And they just found all these different ways to use it in dev and test because it was really great for packaging up development environments and using it for like CI, CD. And, and it just, it, it honestly, people were just getting a lot of value out of it with a really a small amount of effort. So they see all this value in dev and test there's a huge adoption, like that already happened. There was already, you know, a lot of users using it and continues, like, I mean, every DockerCon is just, just getting more and more. But then people ask, how do I use this in, productive, in production? And, you know, you're a lot more conservative about production because, you know, that's, production goes down, you lose money. So, you know, the, the question is, okay, I've been able to do this, I've, you know, used in dev and test, what do I actually do in production? So, like when we started Rancher Labs, you know, we were looking for solutions of how to do this in production. So what do you do? Well, you go and you ask people who've already done it. So we went around and we talked to a lot of people who've already ran, you know, this stuff in production. And so we talked to a lot of web scale companies, early adopters. These are the people who are running containers. And then there's other people, or these are the people who are adopting Docker already. And then there was already people like Google and other companies who have been using container or similar container technologies and they've been already been doing those for years. And so we went and talked to them, okay? So we learned a lot of things, like a lot of really cool, exciting things. As engineers, we get so excited, we see new technologies and new approaches, we get excited about the possibilities, it's like all these cool things you can do, you're gonna take over the world with all this cool stuff. So we like learned orchestration and scheduling and service discovery and overlay networking, routing, microservices, load balancing, raft, everyone loves raft, um, consensus and select, it's like all these different things. So like we learned all these things. And as engineers, we then came up with new names for these things because we love naming things and we're all terrible at it. And so. Like in Swarm mode, we have services and tasks and the routing mesh and Kubernetes are services and pods and replica sets and all these other different terms and all this stuff. Um, and honestly, as like an industry, I think this is where we kind of screwed up. 
um, users, they already saw value in Docker. They were already using it in dev and test. There was already a, a legitimate value. They were packaging up their application and moving through the life cycle, and they wanted to put it in production. So the value was already there, but we basically went and said, okay, well, how are the people running um, these applications in production? And that's where we started to learn about cloud native patterns. And there's nothing wrong with cloud native. Like, it, it's great. It's, it's like, you know, cloud native is, is a evolution of what we would say before of architecting for the cloud in the IaaS world. It's like there's great patterns on how you can operate better in the cloud or scale your applications, these things. But it solves a different problem. It's like what people actually wanted to do was just take their applications and put them into production. They weren't necessarily, hey, how do I actually improve? Like, you know, the, the direct question was not, how do I improve my operations? How do I run it at a higher scale? How do I become Google? Like, all those things are great if that's the problem you're having, but that was not the, like the mass problem at the, at the time. And so what we've kind of done is said of, okay, if you want to put things into production for containers, you need these systems. Like, they're required because that's the way you do it. And that's where we, I think we've kind of fallen apart and made it significantly more complicated than it really needs to be. Because the reality is it doesn't, and we just, we honestly don't have to do that. If you just, if your objective is like, I already have value in this, I just want to get my containers in production. And so, um, you know, it's basically what should you do? You know, what's, what's the better approach to this? And so, you know, basically you should first dockerize your app. So you don't have to switch to microservices. If you do, that's great, but I'll tell you, like, there's downsides to microservices and there's positives. You know, we, um, even in the life cycle of Rancher, as we've, you know, we fully dog food all these concepts and everything, and as we've deployed microservice everything and whatever, um, we ran into problems and then you solve them, but, you know, it's, it's not like a panacea. So, you should dockerize your existing applications. This really should require no code change. Unless you're doing like a lot of like really, really legacy things like tying to specific IPs and stuff like that. But most applications that are fairly modern can just be put into a container with, with very little change. Um, so then you should look at deploying those containers into production using really your existing infrastructure and your existing tools or something very similar to your existing tools. You don't have to reinvent everything to, to get it in there. Um, and basically, as you get like as you get more advanced, you can leverage like more best practices. You can start leveraging these other things like scheduling or orchestration, um, but you don't have to start that way. The important thing is is just to keep it simple because you know as I've you know said a couple times already, you're going to get the biggest benefit with just basically packaging up your application because it's going to improve the agility that you can basically move it from dev test to production. And, and there's other side effects where you're gonna cut cost in infrastructure um, without even doing anything like really fancy. And I'll, I'll talk about that a little later when I get into scheduling. So I just wanna go over, you know, basically what are some simple approaches that, that, you, that you can take. And, and, and some of these are kind of funny because like we build, a, like Rancher, we build like basically orchestration. I've spent my entire career mostly building orchestration systems. And, and a lot of this is I'm gonna tell you, here's ways that you can avoid using them. Um, so you have to remember containers, what are containers, they're really just processes. Like you had things in production before, hopefully. You had things in productions, like they're processes. Now you just put processes in a much cooler package. Um, so you just need to launch those processes in some fashion. Um, so you, like, you don't really have to fundamentally change the way that you're you know, doing things if you don't want to. Like, again, you can, you can continue to move into you know, different patterns and you know, improve, but it's not required up front. So like when you look at orchestration, for example, like the first choice is just basically don't use it. <laughs> um, that's gonna be the option one for most everything, is you don't necessarily have to use orchestration because you can very well just deploy things with configuration management. Ansible, Salt, Chef, Puppet, they all will launch containers. And there's nothing fundamentally wrong with that. You are gonna still get a benefit of putting a, production, putting a container in production and using Chef to launch it is still gonna give you more agility than writing all the, the Puppet stuff you had to do before. Because like the, what you'll see is once you have containers, configuration management, the scope of configuration management drastically reduces you're doing a lot less. So you're spending less time on configuration management and, and more on, on you know, just deploying your application. Um, so if you do want to use an orchestration system, just start simple. Use something that, that's deploying containers in a very predictable way. Like one of the problems is people like, you know, 
they look at the, the features of what an orchestration system can provide, and then they get really creative with it, and they're like, I put a health check here, and a health check here, and do this like scaling group, or, or whatever, and then if this one fails, then that should cause the other, and, and it just like, just don't jump into it. Like, you should really get comfortable with these tools. Um, they're not all perfect. This is still very much a, uh, you know, a developing industry or whatever, the, uh, you know, all these various systems. So it's just, you know, start with very specific, like very predictable ways of deploying your applications. And the last point here is basically right now only orchestrate stateless apps. Um, you can run persistent containers, like that's different, but you don't need to orchestrate them, meaning you shouldn't let like a system automatically detect failures, destroy them, delete them, and like deploy them somewhere else, not for stateful things. Um, those take more care for them and, you know, monitor them and, and run them the way you would kind of normally. Um, okay, so scheduling, again, <laughs> the first approach to scheduling is just don't use it. You don't, you don't actually need a scheduler because you can just use like configuration management to launch containers. But if you do use scheduling, if you decide to use, just use some simple rules. Um, people always have this dream of like, hey, I'm gonna, you know, we're gonna use the scheduler and it's gonna reduce cost and we're gonna have the shared infrastructure. And, um, and I'll tell you, it's really quite hard. That, that, the, the idea of reducing your infrastructure spend by having a fancy scheduling and scheduling algorithms is really hard to achieve. It's, it's not as simple as you would think. You need to put resource constraints on everything. You really need to look at failure boundaries, what noisy neighbors, what can impact everything. Really constraining your applications because the default behavior in Docker is not actually to constrain resources. It, you can grab as much resources as you want. So it requires a certain amount of discipline to plan that out and everything. And so you do end up getting a decrease in infrastructure spend with containers without relying on like a fancy scheduler because the reality is before when you're deploying with virtual machines, your unit of deployment is a, it's a VM. So it's kind of like the smallest unit you're gonna get is like maybe a two gigabyte, four gigabyte thing. Now you're talking about like a, a container, which a container might take up, you know, less memory, or whatever. So even if you're manually placing these things or using configuration management, you know like, okay, my deployment unit is much smaller now and I can put more of them on a host or I can just buy bigger hosts and put more of them on there. And so you don't need fancy scheduling to actually reduce your infrastructure spend. Okay, so, you know, what can you do around networking? Um, just, if you don't need it, don't initially start with overlay networking. It's not actually, you know, again, it might not be required, it depends on your application. But you can run with net hosts. Like, people will tell you, like, oh, that's terrible, you shouldn't do it, but, I mean, why? Before you had a process that was bound to port 80 on this host, now I'm launching a container with a process that's bound to port 80. You know, the, the only problem is like the conflict in the, in the ports if you want to run multiple containers. But again, if you want to run multiple containers uh, all binding to the same port, then you have to look at, well, what's the load balancing? And the things get more complicated. So if you can stick to simpler approaches where it's like, well, I can just use net host, that works. Um, as long as your container's not running root, there are like some tiny little security issues with, with net host, but just in general, don't run your containers as root. Um, or just bind ports to hosts because, you know, if from an external perspective, if I'm running a process on a host or if I'm running a container that binds to a port, from an external perspective, it looks the same. So it doesn't have a big impact on your, on your total infrastructure and how you look at networking in general if you just bind to a host port. Whereas overlay networking ten, has a tendency to, you know, kind of have a bigger impact of how that, that works. Okay, so the, let's see, so uh, service discovery. Um, what, I mean, the first question is like, were you using it before? Because um, some people even really get confused on what, what is service discovery and, and what does it matter? Um, so service discovery within the container world is largely just dynamic DNS, just managing DNS, and you know, there's some fancier things you can do, but for the most part, it's kind of just gone down to DNS. And so when you think about it, I'm deploying services and if I'm in a cloud world and I'm setting up load balancers or I can manage Route 53, it's like you can just manage DNS to do a lot of service discovery yourself if you want. Or don't exactly do service discovery but just use configuration management to put hosts, uh, like put the locations in the environment variables. And, and just in case people are, you know, don't know what service discovery is, I mean service discovery is just basically the idea of when your application comes up, um, it doesn't have to be configured to know, you know, where's my MySQL database. It just finds it. 
but the, in the container world, that operation of finding it is typically looking up a DNS, like just resolving a host name like MySQL, which then re, you know, re, reserve, resolves to a specific IP. So you, know, you can easily just get around that with saying, okay, well, I'm still gonna use configuration management and I'm just gonna put the host name in an environment variable. You know, and so it reads an environment variable before it boots up. I mean, it's not, it's not service discovery at all, but you know, it's simple. Um, okay, uh, persistence. So this is something um, I was mentioning before. It's like, it's somewhat a myth. People say like, you can't run persistent things or databases and containers. You absolutely can. Like in the keynote today, Oracle shipping database, you know, Oracle database in a container. So you absolutely can run uh, databases and persistent applications in containers. The catch is when you mix, mix it with orchestration. Most orchestration systems are really oriented more towards stateless applications. They're not really oriented towards stateful. Um, and a lot of times the decisions that an orchestration system might take would be too aggressive or the wrong decision and you know, can, can just destroy the state, especially when you start dealing with clustered systems that have a very specific way you know, you have three nodes, two of them for a quorum, you lose one, you know, it's like there's all these different scenarios on how to do it. So the general purpose orchestrators typically do not deal well with stateful applications. And this is why you see if like CoreOS is like etcd operator, that's a very specific or orchestrator essentially to deal with etcd, which is a persistent application. And that's really the pattern that I think will continue is like for other, app you know, things, you know, we'll, we'll end up with very specific orchestration for persistent applications. And so that just doesn't work very well today. So the reality is, so just don't, don't use orchestration, or if you are, you know, basically still using a system that's deploying the containers for you, just configure it in such a way that it's like, if a health check fails, it's not gonna delete it. Like, it's just gonna say, like, there's no action. Like, like it, it goes red and it, it doesn't do anything because, you know, a lot of those things require some manual, manual operations to deal with them. So if you are running persistent, just bind mount known paths on the host because you know, there's no problem with launching a container and, launch, and attaching an EBS volume and then just bind mounting in the EBS volume. So you know that like these nodes are gonna be running your database so then you mount in an EBS volume because the nature of a lot of persistent things like they're typically databases, you're not deploying these. Like you might be doing like upgrades of the, the code itself, like MongoDB, a new version of it, but the infrastructure stays relatively static. So attaching volumes and stuff is not like a huge cumbersome activity. And then also, you know, for environments like in production, you attach like a massive EBS volume, but in dev and test, you don't have to bind anything. You just put the host, like it just goes on the host file system because you don't actually need it to be you know, resilient in tons of space. Um, okay, so uh, again, load balancing, because there's, there's a lot of fanciness around what you can do with load balancing or whatever. But really, the, the reality is like, you know, what do you need for containers and load balancing in production is, um, you know, if you just bind mount the containers to, to a port or use net host, um, your existing load balancing solution will continue to work just fine. Um, it's only when you start getting a lot more fancier with overlay networking and whatnot that you might need a container aware load balancer. But for right, but for people, you know, just getting into it, your existing one, you know, for the most part is gonna work just fine. Um, uh, so that's, that was kind of, you know, in the, in the end. Um, so this is basically my conclusion. It's just friends don't let friends over architect. I'm just um, a big, big advocate of just keep it simple um, because you know, if you keep it simple, you'll find like the things where you see, okay, there's a pain point, there's a solution out there most likely to deal with the pain point, then you address that. But the problem that, that I'm seeing right now as I deal with people is they're, they're jumping too much. Like a, they go, okay, um, I need a container solution. So I'm gonna plan my container solution for like 2018 and they're gonna sit down and they decide to evaluate a series of platforms and, and like this big massive effort to like, and, and it's, it's just too much. It's like containers, it's very simple to containerize your application. You can get them into production. You're gonna get a lot of bang for your buck up front. And then as you mature, you look towards microservices, re-architecting your application. Then you look towards cloud native. And there's a lot of benefits of cloud native, um, but those really do solve a lot of different problems. Um, okay, um, so is there any questions? Uh, a couple minutes, I think. Nope, oh. Sure. Would you, would you said uh, try not to use uh, orchestration uh, for uh, persistent storage or, or state, stateful applications? 
Yeah. Is that because you have seen issues? Oh yeah, yeah, for sure, yeah. Because people were like, um, we, we see it ourselves because like we write orchestration systems and um, so it's like, oh, well, we'll, we'll orchestrate like etcd. And then you find out just how really hard that is. Um, because there, you either have one of two things. You have like a traditional system, like a database, which has like failover and then fail back. And, and, the, and these are hard problems. It's like if you've done with, dealt with them before, there's like pacemaker and, and stuff like that. And like, you know, anyone who's like an ops background, those things like they sometimes work, it doesn't always work, it's never, like you still get called in the middle of the night. So like these orchestration systems don't fundamentally make that easier. They're just trying to automate it. Um, so it's still a very hard problem. Um, so the, like for like the traditional ones, and then like the newer stuff that are based on like consensus, like Raft or, or even like a Zookeeper, Paxos based system, those are actually, in my mind, even harder to orchestrate because they have more, more corner cases of what happens when they lose quorum and stuff like that. So most of the general purpose orchestrators are, are you know, basically it's like, okay, I have a service and, and I scale out and I have 10 of them and then if one of the health checks fails in one of the containers, I'm gonna delete that. Well, you know, if I have a quorum based system, if I delete more than the quorum, I'm screwed. So, you know, you don't, you don't want to do it. So they, they just don't work that. So that's why like Kubernetes has specifically like stateful sets for this. But honestly, like stateful sets in itself requires a good amount of knowledge of even on, know how to use that. Um, so it's just the reality of it is it, it's, it's still quite hard to, to, the, to do those things. But you can still containerize your application. So it's like, all, I mean, everything we do, like we run stuff in production for Rancher, everything, all of our stuff is 100% containerized. We run MySQL and HA setups and, and things like that, 100% containerized, but we're not putting them right now like under the you know, control of a orchestration system. It's, you know, we're deploying it, we're using basically like configuration management approaches, technically Rancher OS with cloud in it, but we bring up nodes that already has things like pre-populated on it. <coughs> Okay, that's it. All right, thanks.